So I created this video to teach you how to do two types of ventilation calculations that kind of fall under the flammable liquids spray booth. Um, so here is your prototypical spray booth, a small one, one that a company could purchase. Um, it's got, you know, two walls and a backside which has a wall of um, filters to catch overspray. Um, the this, the roof or the ceiling of it um, has intrinsically safe electrical and it's got some a fire suppression system, some sprinkler heads. Um, so this is the general look of it. So this is what kind of I'm trying to show you the filter bed in the back because that's kind of the key point here that it can it's usually a, a cheaper, less expensive, either a um, kind of a woven fibrous material or a cellulose material. So it's a, it's supposed to allow air to go through it with some resistance, but it's supposed to catch the droplets that are overspray. The idea is you're trying to one contain the not only the paint spray but the volatile volatile organic. Um, compounds that are in the paint that are the carriers from migrating out of the space. You want it to um, push to the back of either the space or the room, the booth if you will. The paint particles which are sticky ad adhere or catch onto the filter bed but then the air, the contaminated air which contains the paint fumes is vented outside. So there are a lot of different configurations. There's smaller, you know, I don't want to get like uh, almost a, a, a fume hood type spray booth to one in which you, it's more sophisticated that you actually go all the way into it. And they have downdraft. They have um, all kinds, and they don't all have filters either. Some have liquid filters. I think the bottom one has that where it catches it through um, a cycling waterfall, but that can get really messy. I've seen it and a lot of people don't like that. Um, but these can also be for electrostatic precipitation in which um, you're charging like a metal part and then it's a, the um, the, the the powder then adheres to it and then they bake it and then it's kind of got a nice finish. Now every spray booth that has the the filter bed has a um, uh, what is this thing a water um, manometer. Thank you. So it measures the pressure drop. On, on the on the right we've got a magnahelic uh, manometer um, and this is a requirement. Every spray booth must have this and basically it's got um, a pressure sensor before and after the filter bed and so what it does is it measures the pressure across the filter bed. So as the filter bed becomes uh, coated with the overspray, there's going to be a higher resistance because there's less holes for the air to pass through. Now, if there's too much resistance, that's going to possibly burn out the motor that's that's running the blower. Um, so that's something that you should always keep an eye on. The reason it's important, I'm going to tell you this, and this is how, the way OSHA teaches it, but a lot of people may not, is that what you do is when you start it with a fresh bank of filters, you're supposed to cover half of it, 50% of it, with cardboard or something that's sealed so that air is only passing through half of the beds. Um, then what you do is you, you basically, before you do that, you put like a green mark. Like So when it's just running, fresh thing, you put in a green arrow, green point. So let's say this here, I just got a point one. That's just a random thing I picked. Cover with 50%, turn it on again, and then you put the red arrow there. Then you remove the cardboard and you start spray painting. And then what you do is you just watch that as the pressure goes up, and it gets to the red point, that's when you know shut it off, change the filters. That's supposed to be your filter bed change schedule. That's what you're supposed to do. A lot of companies go, oh, let's do it in two months. Well, maybe you're wasting a lot of money in um, in filters. Or maybe you say every two months yet you're driving you know, the pressure really high and then you'll be burn out the motor and that's going to be really expensive too. So maybe that's a project you guys may have in the future. You could save a company a lot of money. A lot of them don't just know this basic rule of thumb and using the manometer to set up the filter bed change schedule. The um, ventilation is supposed to be interconnected with the spray gun. And so they can be high and low pressure. Sometimes you've got a feed, so you've got like a pump outside of it. Sometimes it's below it. Sometimes it's above it. And you know it, it varies based on the application and the company. Now, one thing that's required on a 1910-94 is a there needs to be a minimum face velocity. The minimum face velocity is designated so that uh, paint fumes don't escape. They stay within the booth and get pulled out the back and get ventilated outside. What you're supposed to do is use some form of um, Ananometer, which is an air speed, a linear air speed. The one on the left is a hot wire ananometer, the one on the right is a propeller. And what you do is you hold it away from your body and you kind of create out a pseudo grid. Now, I, I've got six by five. You don't have to do that. that can, it can just be 12, which would be three by four. And so let's say maybe you take a measure here one, two, three, four, five, 
6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. You take those measurements, 20 measurements, and you average it. And according to the standard, depending on the size of the booth, it needs to either needs to be a minimum of 100 feet per minute or a minimum of 150 feet per minute. And that's how you determine whether um, you know the blower is pulling enough adequate amount of air to make sure that everything stays within the booth itself. Otherwise, you, you know you can go into a to a garage, or whatever, and you can uh, you can smell the paint. It's like, well, they get a spray booth. Why am I smelling paint? Well, either they're spray painting outside of the booth, which is illegal. You can't do that because you're you're introducing flammable vapors into the work environment, or maybe the blower is broken or recycling wrong or whatever it might be. And so this is how we determine. We set up a grid and we average anywhere from 12 to 20. 12 to 12 to 30 if you want measures because it's going to it's going to be um, a little bit faster towards the edges because it's you know it's moving in around an edge a little bit slower in the middle it's kind of the way it works actually no there's there's less resistance it's going to be slower on the sides quicker in the middle so let's shift it to the liquid storage room the inside storage room there's a minimum requirement this is generally how they look we saw it in earlier videos um, and it's got the kind of the specific things, the design. Um, and the one I want to talk about is the exhaust. So you have to have a continuous airflow um, system so that if any vapors are released, they're captured and, and sent out. And there needs to be a makeup air, I think, on the opposite side of the room where you have the intake. And what the, what the standard says under D4, 4, is that right? Um, Roman numerals. Uh, at least six air changes per hour, A-C-H, air changes per hour, six air changes per hour. So basically you need to know the volume of the room, multiply it by six, and you got to turn that over six times in an hour. So let's take a look at that. We've got another side view here. So here's what we do. we got to determine the approximate volume of the room, which is width times depth times height. You can approximate it and just go conservative. Um, then according to the standard, it's six air changes per hour, which is six times the volume, which is in cubic feet now. Then we really all you need is to determine the cross-sectional area of the inlet, the ventilation inlet, right, like right there. And then you can calculate what the linear velocity needs to be in order to meet this minimum standard. So I, what I did is um, from the video of the paint shop, I I had called out the dimensions of both the spray booth and also the inside storage room. So what I said is it's uh, 12 high by 10 wide by 11 and a half deep. Which you multiply those together, you get the volume. So I've got 1,380 cubic feet. Now I want to calculate the minimum air exchange, the minimum air turnover per hour, which is 6 times the 1,380, giving us uh, 8,280 cubic feet per hour. Now you want to you want to convert that to per minute because CFM or cubic feet per minute is kind of the standard unit for ventilation. So what I did is I just needed to cancel out the hour and put in the minutes. So I divided it. Excuse me. I divided the uh, total air change per hour divided by 60 minutes. Came up with the 138 cubic feet per minute. Now the inlet, I had called that out as well. I measured it. It's, it was uh, 12 inches by 6 inches, which we need everything in feet. You got to keep the units the same. 12 inches is one foot. Foot. Um, 6 inches is a half a foot. Multiply the two together, we get half of a square foot. Now, so the question is, what is the minimum linear velocity? So we'd, we'd use the same propeller thing. What's the minimum linear velocity? We kind of put it a couple places at the inlet, and then average it. What does it need to be to meet OSHA's standard? Because we know what is the volumetric flow, and now we know the cross-sectional area. To calculate that, you just basically take the volumetric rate divided by the cross-sectional area. It'd be like taking the linear um, flow rate, which we could just do, multiply by the cross-sectional area, and you get volume rate. That's basically the, the conversion of it. That's basic, I, don't know, well, I was going to say physics, but that's just like basic um, geometry, chuck trigonometry I'm not sure it's very straightforward so the minimum linear velocity at the inlet I took the volumetric flow divided by the cross-sectional area and I got 276 feet per minute so that's the flow rate that should be going through the inlet in order to meet that six air changes per hour at minimum it'd be great if it was more than that because then we know we have something that's pulling out and and one thing I want to just quickly point out is look where it's located it's located on the floor why is it located near the floor I think it's supposed to be within 12 inches of the floor if I remember correctly because um, flammable vapors tend to be heavier than air 
and therefore they collect near the floor. And by having the inlet near the floor, then you have a better chance of capturing them and releasing them outdoors, improve ventilation. And then the air to intake tends to be up kind of across the room. So the clean air comes in and helps push the, um, the vapors as they go down in and out. So that's how you calculate um, the flow rates, the required linear velocity. Now you could just come in and, you know, calculate one or the other and calculate forwards or backwards depending on what you have or what you get. But that's the basic idea and that's all I wanted to cover for this video. And you're probably going to have to do this for the study sheet and it's probably going to come up in an exam possibly or quiz.